organizers for putting on this great meeting. I'm really enjoying my first visit to Wyoming and yeah, the, that bus ride up over the ridge, that was, that was worth the whole journey just to see all the beautiful countryside. Um, so this, I guess, is sort of fitting into a little bit of the theme of this conference. We're looking at analytic things. And so the, as we've heard from many of the other speakers that main starting point is free, free independence is you start with moments. You say, here's a rule for computing mixed moments uh, if you know individual moments. And then you have to do some work if you want to go to something beyond polynomials. And, um, so in the engineering, physics, and statistics literature, people don't want to stop with polynomials. They want to put in smooth functions, or other kinds of functions, resolvents, and so on. And then you have to do some work to justify going that little bit, that final step from a polynomial to a limit of polynomials. And turns out to be a little bit, or at least in my experience, a little tricky because the random variables that you're dealing with are almost always unbounded. So you always have to worry about domains and checking things. And um, sometimes it can get pretty complicated. Um, and so uh, what I want to talk about today is trying an, uh, a solution we found to the problem in something called in higher order freeness, or well, second order in this case, um, so um, where we were able to uh, prove that some limits could you could pass some limits through and, uh, and then get results of smooth functions. Um, and um, the, at the moment, we, so we, came, we, we uh, wanted to get an integral representation for something and couldn't really prove something at an integral representation, but there is something called functions of bounded Frechet variation, which um, seems to have just disappeared from the literature. Man, I, it was really, it was in exercise 84 in chapter four of Dunford and Schwartz. <laughs> that was the only place we ever found it. And um, it's kind of a little twist on the history of functions of bounded variation, but it's the thing that works in this example at this level of generality for a lot of the random matrix ensembles that most people want to work with. I think something stronger is true. Uh, at the moment, I can't say much about that, um, but it seems like that you should be able to go a lot further than this, but this is where we got to. So let me just, uh, probably should get out of the way, uh, give a little setup. So we're just going to start with the self-adjoint n by n random matrix. C plus will be the upper complex of the half length. And you've seen this, you you take a uh, complex number z, z in the upper half plane, you take z minus x, you take its inverse, you take the normalized trace, and then you take the expectation of that, you call that gn of z, you get an analytic function. For many examples, those functions converge as the size of the matrix goes to infinity to a nice analytic function in the upper half plane, which is the gives you the Cauchy transform of the limit distribution. Um, so most of those examples are done just by explicitly co-computing and then showing that there is a limit. Um, you assume something about your random matrix and you just go ahead and compute. In uh, second order freeness, so there's not gonna be any freeness in this talk because I'm only gonna talk about one matrix. So, um, but, this is the these are the, this is the things that we wanted to look at. We wanted to look at. Oh, I don't know. That's the end. Shouldn't be there. I'm sorry. That's just that's just a random. End. <laughs> uh, um, it should be the trace of the resolvent with a, a z and another one with a w. We get two random variables. We take their covariance, and. Um, uh, now we get a function of two complex variables. And we want to just see what can, can you take some limits and what happens? Do you get a, what kind of a function do you get in the limit? And what can you say about the function when you do covariance? And um, 
Fourth cumulant. Fourth cumulant. So on, and you can get to more complicated things. Uh, Fourth cumulant. Fourth cumulant. Fourth cumulant. So on, and you can get to more complicated things. And the only place I ever saw anybody do this is these three papers that Dyson wrote back in 1963. But he just defined these things. He, as far as I can tell, he never proved anything. He just said he called them cluster functions and stuff like that. But he never did anything. And I've never found anybody ever looked at those again. Very recently in, uh, in uh, I guess it's a two-dimensional quantum gravity community. And some, in the physics literature, there's some new work looking at these higher order um, freeness things and, and genus expansions for higher order things. And of course, it's all combinatorial and just formal power series. But um, maybe there'll be some interest in going to the third and higher level. Um, I. Uh, one of us is a student at Queens, Daniel Munoz, who was hoping to come, but he couldn't get a visa. And um, he, part of his PhD thesis, just worked out something about the third order free cumulants of uh, Figner matrix. But again, it's just combinatorial. So the analytic function theory you can bring in, you get a function of three variables. Anyway, today I'm going to talk about. Two variables. Okay, so I decided to put this example in here just to try and give you a feel of the uh, the del well, I, I could, the delicateness of this. So that often when you read papers in the literature on this, it feels like, like um, you're kind of a dream state. So things move around and they appear and disappear. But did I really see that? <laughs> Um, because so often there's not precise statements or no definitions and not much in the way of justification, but it feels like it should be true. Um, but so here's an example. So let's take a complex Wishart matrix with shape parameter one. I'll take some moments. So I put a little superscript in here to indicate that I'm taking the moment at the finite level. And I'm gonna look at one other thing. I take two normalized traces. The expectation I call that MJK. And um, these two numbers are more or less the same, except some lower order terms. So some people call that concentration or something. I don't know. I just that word seems to get used a lot, but um, this is a little thing, combinatorial thing that you can work out. Sometimes we go by the name the Springer Dyson method because the entries of this matrix are Gaussian. You can do integration by parts. It brings down an X, uh, an X. And then when you put this through, that you get this little. I mean, I've, I've rewritten this in a way that makes it nice for my notation. This is not the way you ever see it. You get this little recurrence relation uh, between these. This double thing and this single thing. And then you can make a formal power series. And two variables here, one variable over there. And that 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 relation just gives you this equation here as formal power series. You can then do this thing like a cluster function where you take the difference of these two things and you make another formal power series. Of course, this one is just the difference of these two things. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to get rid of this and go to the next slide. I hope get your little cameras up and go ch -ch -ch, so that you're going to remember. <laughs> um, so I repeated that equation up here. Remember, these things go to zero. So you just take the limit of this as a formal power series. In other words, you just let the coefficients converge. And this guy goes to zero because of this condition here. So you just get this condition here. And so we can think of um, this uh, GN, uh, there shouldn't be a parenthesis there, sorry. This uh, G that we had before. Well, okay, there is no power series because the support of the measure is the whole line. So there's the radius of convergence at infinity is zero. But there is another mathematical tool you can use. 
And so there's some asymptotic expansion. So remember a normal a normal series convergence you fix the variable and you let n the number of terms go to infinity. Well, an asymptotic you do the other way around. You fix the number of terms and you let z go to infinity or z go to infinity. So that's called an asymptotic expansion. And so you do have an asymptotic. These things are equal as an asymptotic expansion. And you do the same thing at the limit and you get this equation, which is the correct quadratic equation for the Cauchy transform of the Marchenko Pasteur law. And so now this is this vague dreams, dream state. Did I do what Halmo said we should do? Can this be turned into a completely Okay, so. Well, I'll say a little bit about that, but what I want to do this is just go to two variables. And the approach I'm going to take is uh, completely different. Okay, so what's our theorem? <laughs> um, we, so we're just starting with a general self adjoint random matrix. Let's assume that you have moments, that those limits exist. You have moments and the limits, the moments converge. Yeah, too many M's in this thing, so I decided to call them L. And the same for these fluctuation moments. Assume that they exist and that you get a limit. Now, well, yes. Is there a reason why you use a small TR and then a big TR? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is back to the question you were asking me a couple of, yesterday. Is this phenomenon, oops, sorry. If you, this, these are all normalized and these things go to zero. So to get something interesting, you have to multiply by n squared. Otherwise everything shrinks to a point to zero. Right, so when all of these things, there's a scaling thing that comes in with the size of the matrix, you always have to just throw that in. Otherwise if you don't, it either blows up to infinity or shrinks to zero. And to get something interesting, you have to choose the right scaling limit. But that's an important point. You, here I put unnormalized traits. There I put normalized traits. Anyway, you just, that is the right scaling, that is the right scaling yeah. And um, in order to make things go, you have to look at the largest eigenvalue thing, because we're going to have to truncate to do things. And the only way to control that truncation is to get some idea, some bound on the probability of getting a large eigenvalue. But we don't need very much. So most examples you get, this, this is, you get much smaller upper bounds. This is a very mild assumption. Then we need an, uh, a Poincaré kind of inequality. But if you look at the variance of the trace of a function applied to it, there's a constant k, which doesn't depend on f, such that that's given by the soup norm of the derivative of the square of the derivative. And so F has to have a derivative for this to make sense. Okay. And so, yeah, in, in work that I did with, uh, well, it was Andrew Nika and Roland Spiker and Benoit Collins and Dr. Snidey a long time ago, we looked at the second order Cauchy transform. So you just defined it formally like this. And that's as far as we ever went. We never said anything converged to anything. We could compute some examples where it did, but we never could say for certain whether anything ever converged. So everything, oh, the whole thing is just at the level of combinatorics. But now I can say something more. <laughs> so with these assumptions, I can say that for Z and W large enough, this this series converges and we get an analytic function on two copies of the plane with the real line removed. And in addition, this function is the limit of those things for finite n. So that they could say the um, physicist dream or whatever, I don't know, maybe it's a dream would be too much because they often, the tricky thing is that in the people just assumed that this was true. And it seemed to me, even in the one variable case, people just assumed that somebody else had proved it. 
but they don't know who, but they just assumed that by now it would have been proved. So let's just move on. Uh, so it was kind of a strange thing. Anyway, I, I, was, I knew that nobody really worked too much on the two variables. So I think nobody really did that in the second or two variable case. Okay, so we could say a little more. So again, there's those three conditions. So A0, remember that was the one about having moments of first and second order. A1 was controlling the size of the largest eigenvalue and A2 was the Poincaré inequality. So we're gonna assume always that those things hold. And we can say a little more. If you, those conditions hold, then there's actually a function on this square of bounded fresh A variation. And that whenever you take any two differentiable functions, which contains derivative of this interval. And uh, you define this function rho fg to be this limit of trace of f applied to x, trace of g applied to x. That limit exists, and it's given by this integral where you put the derivatives in there. And uh, I'm just going to explain a little bit about what this integral is. So um, if you go back a hundred years, there are a lot of papers about different kinds of bounded variation and more than one variable. So there are quite a few competing ideas as to what would be the right thing. Now there's only one, but um, that's why, yeah, this is a little strange. So anyway, it works in this case, but whether this is really what's the right answer is I, I don't know. Um, so what's fresh A variation? So you take any partition of the interval, S and T, which are different numbers, and I take any sequence of signs, theta and eta, and I look at this uh, delta. Remember this delta is you, this is just the kind of the variation over the square. You put in arbitrary signs, and it has to be bounded. By K. I think I've got some values. Sorry about that. Um, what's regular variation is that you, you, you just put absolute values inside the sums. That's the regular bounded variation. So this is weaker. So bounded variation implies bounded. Fresh A variation. And what Fresh A showed is that you do get an interval representation. And it's the same, you do the, it's the Stilchy's integral again, but the difference is this. Bounded variation would mean you could take a function of two variables and integrate it. Bounded fresh A vari variation means you take a function of X and you multiply it by a function of Y. So it's like the algebraic tensor product versus the C star tensor product. <laughs> so fresh A variation is only the algebraic tensor product, not the C star tensor product. That's why it doesn't look really right. But anyway, that's all we could prove. So just left it there. So going a little faster, you guys aren't asking any questions. Okay. So I've got two slides left. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> well, I told you it just, uh, um, I sort of, I had this vague dream one night that I was back in grad school and I was still looking through the problems in chapter four <laughs> of Dunford and Short. I said, I know I saw something. <laughs> anyway, I got my copy out of the basement, put through it, and there it was. And they referred to some paper in some Japanese journal. And um, I'd never heard of this journal, but fortunately the paper was English. And then from there to another paper, another paper. And eventually we found for Fresh A's paper. So it's yeah, very weird experience. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, that chapter four of Dunford and Schwartz, this is for the younger generation here. <laughs> um, they computed the dual of every known Banach space at the time or something. And so I you know I don't if you ever want to know, know the dual of a Banach space or what the weak topology is on something, that's where you go. And I don't think anybody's ever really done that stuff again. Um, yeah, so that's, let me just try and say a little bit about the technical side of how you do it. So the main thing is that you have to truncate. So, I mean, this is very common in random matrix theory. You truncate your function because 
Here's the problem. When you know something about moments, but moments are unbounded functions. And all the other theorems about convergence are about bounded functions. So you have to make that awkward step where you chop something away and reduce an unbounded thing to a bounded thing, but you don't throw away too much. So it's very tricky. And then I, uh, this is this little inequality isn't in our paper because I didn't really try and think about it hard enough until I was preparing this talk. But I think this captures the essence of this technique here. So let me try and explain that. Uh, so if I take a continuous function on minus n to m, I'm just going to take the soup norm and call that norm sub m. If I take a polynomial and I take the normalized trace, I can bound this by the soup norm of p. Well, that's because I'm taking a probability measure. So, I mean, the, w the way you do this is you just turn this into eigenvalues, right? You don't, um, I get the soup norm of P and then I get some other term. And this is just the cauchy schwarz inequality. I get <laughs> the square of the polynomial. Right. So I take the trace. And then I get the, the probability that the matrix is bigger than the norm, that I have an eigenvalue bigger than M, an absolute value. Now, when you look at this, you see, I'm assuming that this thing goes to zero at a certain speed. In this case, that thing converges, so that's bounded. So in the limit, that second term goes to zero. So when you have some probability measures that are initially supported, but the support is coming down to something finite, you just get the right bound in the end. Um, even though for finite n, you don't get the right. I mean, you, the thing's unbounded, so you, you couldn't have something like this. But you got to figure out a way of adding something in that disappears when you take the, the large n limit. OK, and then so there's just a bunch of lemmas. I'll just show you what, how the truncation goes. So there's the truncation of a function. You make it 0 if the argument's bigger than m. And then you want to compare the thing where you put the untruncated thing to the thing where you put the truncated thing in. How far away do you go by chopping? So you got to do a few steps. And maybe I could have just skipped the first step here since I'm not going to prove anything. But if you have bounded functions, you can get uh, an inequality like this. So these powers just come from using the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. That's where. You get square roots and stuff. If you assume the functions are unbounded, but not too badly, then you, you can find a constant, which only depends on the functions, but that this argument works for every n. The same thing, but I, but I have an n squared here. And this, this number, k f comma g, it only depends on the moments of the matrix up to some size. And that size is the degree of the polynomials that bound F and G. Right? That's all, because that's what you do. You just replace F and G for large things by some powers of the independent variable. And then you use those bounds and you get this thing here. And so, okay, see, so, so this, is, this, is, this is how you truncate. So when we truncate, now we can use uniform convergence kind of arguments, because now we've made everything nice and bounded. So when you put all these things together, you get the same kind of inequality that we had before. So if I take two bounded things and I take the restriction to this interval, um, yeah, and I assume that they're smooth in there, then these things make sense. I get this inequality here. And this k is the k that I had back from the Poincare inequality. That k is from that axiom A2. And um, so this is going to give me an upper bound. And this is the thing that goes to 0. Because, um, OK, there was a fixed numbers. And we're assuming that goes down to 0. If you jack it up a little bit and they're only polynomially bounded, then you get a similar thing with an n squared in here. 
And again, this is a thing will go to zero. So in the limit, you just get an inequality like this. And now you have a function, a bilinear functional on some normal vector space, and you have some density things, and you can just extend by continuity. Apply Frechet's theorem. And then you use, okay, what, what functions do you take? You take those resolvent functions. You say f of t is a, you fix a, you fix a z, and you take f of t to be z minus t inverse. That's your function of t. And you put that in there, and then you get this convergent here will give you the, the proof of the theorem. So the, the whole delicate part of this argument is to maneuver into a place where you can prove that by figuring out exactly how much to assume about the matrix so that you get a nice quality. That's eight out of eight, so I'm done. Hi, Brian. Class of random matrices, are you able to verify yeah, so, the Poincare inequality? Yeah, so here we have to rely on others. We don't go out and prove our own Poincare inequality. So we just comb the literature and say, okay, once in here, there's lots, there's quite a few other papers where this is done for various ensembles. Um, but we don't make any contribution to that. Uh, I'm I just wondering, like, yeah. what types of random matrix models have these one correct? Yeah, so Gaussian, I assume, would keep Gaussian and block Gaussian. So, uh, my co author is Mario Piard. Right. So, I said to me that's so clear. In his PhD thesis, he looked at fluctuations of block Gaussian matrices, and we wanted to say, okay, push this through. And so they satisfy that. And we actually. <laughs> This means where you um, chop it up into blocks and you, and you multiply blocks by some um, um, numbers. Yeah, you just you know, block by block, you modify things. And um, so we wanted to prove it for that. And they, in our paper, we proved that those matrices, just scaling up the Hager up your Bjornsson argument. And it also works for Wishart matrices and. Um, I don't know the, the, the full extent of the generality. So, um, oh yes, the, the book of uh, Pasteur and Cherubina, that's, the, that's what we mentioned in our paper. That has a really long exhaustive list of things for which it's known. Um, and, but as far as I know, there isn't a general theory. So well, maybe Marwa can say something about that, but mostly people just take an example, a model and compute and um, solve some equations, compute some derivatives, get some bound and so on. Um, so I don't know about a general theory about when it, when it that's true, but I mean, uh, the crucial thing here, yes, is that this was a, a big stumbling block for, for us was that, see the continuity here, to differentiate. So uh, if you just put F and G in there, that would be continuous in the algebraic tensor product, but now you compose it with a differential operator. So when you go to second order things, you've got to differentiate, which had been observed in some examples that derivatives were appearing. But as far as I know, this is the first time where you show that it really has to be there that it, it, um, this, uh, this row function, which is just this limit of applying the functions to the matrices is not continuous in the functions themselves. It's continuous in the derivative of the functions. What is this U? How do I find U? <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, well, it's, it's the same thing whenever you have a, a I mean, you use representation here. It's just the resubstitution. I mean, you you have a linear functional on space, and you say it's given by a measure. So it's matrix model. 
how, how can I determine that you Those can you write down hard. moments of you or something? Yeah, it's pretty hard because uh, you, you look at this book by uh, Peter Forrester, about 700 pages long, and it's full of calculations. And he doesn't explicit, but some of them are these U's, right? And you compute for 18 pages and you take some here, meet polynomials, and you do this and you do that. take some limits. It's a gigantic calculations to find explicit U's. I know of two, Semicircle and Marchenko Pastor. I think there's, yeah, I've been, I think I can do guessed in Mackay, but I've never followed all the way to the end. Uh, I'll do it, but, but I think those are, th those are examples where you can do it. But mostly it's like the same thing. Someone gives you um, um, a function and says compute its Fourier transform. Well, maybe you can, maybe you can't. Um, it often involves solving an equation, which there may not be a function that, that's a known function that explicitly solves it. So you can't do much. Moments, something that implicitly determines the U that you could yeah, describe. Yes, that's right. That's the theorem of fresh A that says whenever you have a function satisfying certain conditions, it has to be given by a U. But it doesn't, there's no formula for finding, just like for the, um, mom, the, the regular moment problem. Yeah, except by doing an inverse Fourier transform or something, if you can compute something. But is there any like a, a second order R transform and a corresponding? Oh, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I didn't bring that into this talk, but. Um, okay, so let me put it on the board. Yeah. If anybody will be going to meeting in London next week, you'll see this, but. Um, so there's a, what's, what's, this is from a paper of uh, Benoit Piotr Roland in the 2007. So the defined second order cumulus. So there's two variable cumulants, and this is just the same formula you do in one variable case. And then there's one more thing here. Yeah, so this term here, pretty interesting function because it's invariant under unit sense. So, so actually, if you look at the original version of the paper, we had a G there. Eventually, somebody, Roland, I think, noticed, okay, it also works for one over G. <laughs> And of course, if you translate translation, you kill the translation. So that's pretty much a proof that it's invariant under Mobius transformations. And there's a, some papers back from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, this Menachem Schiffler, I think, about um, things, stuff on Riemann circuits and so on. And he mentions this, and it's connected to the Schwarzian derivative. Um, big mystery. I have no idea how to connect that to free probability. Um, I have dozens of papers on my computer that I keep trying to understand. Um, this is a very mysterious thing. But anyway, that's we just found it by hacking our way through uh, the combinatorics of annular permute non crossing annular permutations and. Somehow this formula just appeared. 
uh, not this isn't the original version. Of course, there were clunk clunkier versions, and then eventually, one by one, they were simplified. Um, this does make, I mean, of course, when you differentiate the log, you get rid of the, the branches, so you can forget about that anyway. The one thing that's interesting in this paper of Schiffler, he says, the unit valence of a function is hard, and complex function is hard to de describe, but that's equivalent to the regularity of this function. And um, so, this is all about univalent functions on the disk or the upper half plane. Um, thank you for asking the question, Taylor. But this is, yeah, I, 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 I this part, yeah, this, this is a really interesting part. Um, there's another way of writing this that uh, Gaetan Barreau showed me. Equality of some differential forms under using the Cauchy transform as a change of variables. Um, yeah, I don't think that we put it in this paper, but I just mentioned it in another a paper I wrote with Octavio. Uh, just because we don't use it for anything, but it just seems it's worth knowing that you can write it as an equality of differential forms on a Riemann surface. And uh, I think this is sort of a key part of this uh, work of Barreau and Felda and uh, Felix Slide on um, topological recursion and higher order freeness. Um, I, I, that's for next week. I, I'm hoping to learn more about it next week. All right.